This new rapid test, they could become more widely available within the U.S. within just weeks. And here to answer your questions, Dr. Daniel Kritzkis, Chief of Infectious Diseases at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Great to see you, Dr. Kritzkis. Good to see you, Erica and Ben. All right, Dr. Kritzkis, so what can you tell us about these rapid at-home tests? I will admit, I used one just over the weekend. My son woke up with a runny nose, kind of was stuffed up, and we gave him one. We had one in the house to make sure he was not positive for COVID. It was negative. But do you think they're pretty easy to use for most people? So I think the tests are easy to use, and I, I think they have uh, an appropriate place in uh, testing for COVID. The, 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 basically, you just do a swab of the nose or, or some saliva, and then uh, it, it's pretty easy to develop the test and, and read the result at home. The challenge is that they are best at ruling in COVID-19 in people who have symptoms. They're not as accurate in ruling out COVID-19 if you get a negative test, and they can give false positive results. So you'd want any positive test confirmed by a PCR test. Yeah, well, that's what we wanted to ask you about next. We know these PCR tests, they're considered kind of the gold standard. They can take hours, if not days, to process. So should you really be backing up these at-home rapid tests with those PCR tests? Well, I, I think it depends on the situation. So if uh, if you get a positive result, you'd want to have it confirmed to know that it was positive and that you could then take a, appropriate measures. Uh, if you had a negative test result, you could redo the test uh, in a day or two if the symptoms persisted, because the more times you test, the less likely you are to continuously get a, a negative test. I think people also have to be aware that these tests may not be acceptable in, in certain settings, especially for certain kinds of travel, where they really are asking for a, a nasopharyngeal, you know, deep nose sample tested by PCR. All right, we want to ask you about some other test results that we received from the state recently. In the past week, more than 3,700 residents who are fully vaccinated tested positive for the virus. If you look at the data from the past couple of months, infections among fully vaccinated people do account for a little more than a third of new COVID cases. It ranges between, say, 35 and you know 40 or 45 percent. How should we interpret that number? Because when I post this data on Twitter, for instance, a lot of people say, Gee, that seems awfully high when you're looking at the total number of new cases. Yeah, it, it, it is confusing. Unfortunately, it's, it's hard to really get a, a good um, understanding of this without going too far into the math. But what people can take home is less than 1% of vaccinated people have become infected with COVID. And the reason the numbers are high in terms of cases is because so many people are vaccinated. So if 1% of 4.5 million people get uh, COVID, then you come up with about 40,000 cases among the vaccinated. But among the unvaccinated, the rate of becoming infected is much, much higher, uh, basically uh, four to five times greater at least uh, for uh, unvaccinated people. We're now seeing vaccine protection in the state in the last couple of weeks of about 90% for uh, preventing infection uh, that leads to symptoms and much more effective in terms of preventing hospitalization and death, of course. Okay, Dr. Daniel Kritzkis, it's because we're so vaccinated. Right. That's the answer. Okay, Absolutely. thanks as always for being with Thank us. Thank you. You're very welcome.